Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, today on the show, we are honored to be sitting down with Port Hawkesbury, Nova Scotia Mayor and President of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, Brenda Chisholm Beaton. But before we get into today's interview, I want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you to our new subscribers to the Cross Border Interviews. Your contributions to the show help us to continue to deliver more great content like you're about to see. We want to take a moment to thank Amy from Ontario and author Samantha from Manitoba. Your $3 contributions have made an impact in making sure that this show continues to grow. Now, on to our interview with Mayor Brenda Chisholm. Beaten. Uh, Mayor Brenda, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start sort of to get to know who Brenda is in the realm of municipal politics. So I, I want to ask the first question I've asked every single municipal leader who's come on the show, so you're no exception. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Brenda? That That's a really interesting question. Thanks for that. Sometimes I ask myself that all the time. <laughs> So I, I guess if I were to go back, uh, go back in time to, um, I guess the decision, which was the the summer of 2012, um, to to decide to run. Um, at that point in time, um, I had already been running a, a business in Port Hawkesbury uh, called the Fleur de Lis Tea Room and Dining Room since 2003. I uh, also have a master's in community economic development through the anthropology department at, from the University of Manitoba in my hometown, running a business um, and really feeling at that point in time, you know, can I use my university experience um, to help grow my hometown? Um, so uh, there was a unique opportunity as well that summer. Uh, I, re I clear, just, distinctly remember a newspaper article um, indicating that a lot of the long-serving uh, municipal elected officials were not reoffering, And I thought, you know what, this could be a great uh, window of opportunity. So I did put my name forward, uh, very first time, you know, with a, kind of like a, a, a really early blooming concept of what municipal government was and, and a whole lot of learning curve. Uh, and luck, luckily, it was I had great success uh, during the election. I came in with the most votes. Um, and it's, I know there's a little bit of a departure, but um, what I learned through the campaigning process is I was the first uh, female that had come forward to run in, in two decades in, in our town, which I know. Wow. That was the look. That, <laughs> your look was the same look I had at the door. Some people were telling me this. I'm like, you stop, stop the press, really. <laughs> So at, at that time, um, yeah, so that, that's, that's what I had found out. Um, so it was great to be able to, to serve, um, you know, in, in that capacity, you know, where there had been such a, a long gap uh, for, for female elected representation. And I came in as deputy mayor my very first year. So correct me if I'm wrong here for Port Hawkesbury, the deputy mayor is elected with the per, with the candidate who receives the most votes out of the councillors, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so we, we have a four four elected of officials that sit with the mayor and the mayor is a separate um a separate uh, election and it's four year term. So depend the people actually choose the order for deputy mayor. So um, whoever has the most votes to uh, whoever has, is in fourth place, everybody gets a turn. So I came in first shot as deputy mayor. Absolutely. So just 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 for clarification, the uh, the the Port Hawkesbury ma deputy mayor is elected when the councillors, whoever gets the first uh, the highest amount, is the deputy mayor. Correct. A absolutely, and and no two councils do it the same way. As I've kind of figured out through conversation. So for the town of Port Hawkesbury, um, the people actually decide the order of the deputy mayor and they decide who they want first as deputy mayor. So um, where I was the top vote getter, I came in right off the cuff uh, as deputy mayor, like, welcome to municipal politics, you know, and, and I think I, as I remember back, the, the current mayor at the time decided to go um, to Florida for a few months and I was like, okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> really <laughs> getting thrown do, into the deep end. <laughs> let's do this trial by fire. Um, it was great though. Like we, you know, it was it was actually a really great opportunity to, you know, have a, a really expedited um, you know, knowledge of municipal government and really kind of do that from the mayor's chair right off the cuff, kind of learn all the processes, what a muni municipality does. And I got to tell you, I loved every second of it. Like my heart is is all in on it. Before we talk about the role of deputy mayor that you were served, councillor and mayor, I want to get a little bit to uh, get to know you a little bit more. And sure, I, 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 I love asking I love asking this question because it, it tells me if you had aspirations as a kid, did you ever want to be a politician? Was politics ever in Brenda's blood that you said, I follow it, I see what's going on locally, federally, provincially, I could see myself in the halls of power one day? Absolutely not. I Not for a second. I So, and I, I think that is part of the reason why I have become such a staunch advocate for uh, just for gender equity and for um, encouraging and promoting women in local government because I didn't at that time have that invitation to even think those thoughts um, when I was growing up. You know, we had a long serving um, council, like a lot of, you know, uh, repeat um, and very few women. So uh, when I was elected in, in 2012, I was only the fourth woman in the history of our town uh, to run. And so now, just in looking back at that, like, why would I have never thought that I could excel as a politician? Now, I want to make sure that I'm very purposeful in providing that invitation so that all little girls and little boys can see themselves quite clearly um, in this role. So uh, I like to tell like girl guides or, or, or boy, boy scouts that come and visit me at the mayor's office from time to time, I'm just keep, keeping the seat warm for one of you guys. And, you know, because this is a job on loan and I don't see it as my job. I see it as a job that I have to earn every single day and a job that, you know, once elections roll around uh, that, you know, if they like what I've done and if they like who I am, if they if they see themselves in my leadership, then uh, they will choose me again. Now, you, you made the ultimate choice to put your name for it for municipal politics, but you could have chosen many different levels, federal, provincial or even municipal or school board. What was the decision? What was the catalyst to say Brenda's voice is best served around the council table? You talk about gender parity, which is great, but there must have been an issue or was there a desire to say, I want to serve my community. And I think that the council table is the best way that I can serve my community. Well, from from my university experience in community economic development and also my business experience uh, running the Fleur de Lis tea room and dining room, actually with my father, it's kind of a father daughter uh, business endeavor, um, which is a whole nother webcast. <laughs> <You know>? um, <laughs> it's, it's been amazing. And I guess looking around our hometown um, and just seeing like, oh my gosh, like, like, municipal government is a the government of proximity you are working closest to the people that you represent and I thought man I could really make an impact at the local level with my knowledge so what what really kind of gets me excited about um, community economic development is not that you're going to go in and fix things it's that you're going to go in and create an enabling environment for growth and prosperity and also that you are not the necessary cog in the machine. So essentially you need to work yourself out of a job so that if you ever are taken out of the scenario, that community is still gonna thrive and grow. So it's a different kind of leadership. Um, I don't wanna make myself kind of like a that necessary cog in order for things to go forward. You are just kind of, um, I guess the best leadership in my mind is the kind of leadership that goes around creating other leaders and, and enabling other leaders to step up to the plate and then all of a sudden you have an army of people working really hard in your municipality and I mean I guess that's that's kind of my my leadership vibe and why I thought that local government was the place for me now mind you I've had invitations um to to run in other levels of government uh, but right now my heart is is um you know quite lodged at the local level 
And, you know, not saying that I wouldn't consider, um, but at this point in time, you know, there's still lots of, there, like, uh, yeah, like Robert Frost, there's miles to go still at the local level. So maybe someday, but at this point, um, local, the local government is, uh, is, is somewhere where I feel like I can make the most impact at this time. Now, you've been in office for revel- relatively 11 years now, first elections, first putting forward in 2012. Now, things have changed in that time. Municipalities, the issues that municipalities are dealing with have changed a lot recently. But before we talk about the issues, I want to talk. About, uh, I want to ask this. What's changed about you? What's changed about Brenda in that time to make her a better leader and a better municipal representative for the people of her community that you can say to the people, look, you know what? Sometimes we do get it wrong, but we are making the best, uh, we're putting our best best foot forward for the people of Port Hawkesbury. Um, so I will have to say some of the ways that I've grown in my time at, at the municipal table is coming in very early in 2012 with kind of a mindset of what what can we do in the town um, to impact change by the town within the town. And as I continued along my municipal journey, um, just discovering that so much more is possible if we work um, with regional collaboration, if we um, start thinking, what can we do as a region for our region, where you definitely will accelerate the kind of impact, growth, and prosperity that we actually need. Um, I'm sure not just uh, in Nova Scotia or in the street region, uh, in the Cape Breton, Unamagi region, where, where I work um, as a leader with other leaders, but all across Canada. Like, I, I think that, um, you know, the the days of working in silos is, uh, you know, I'm not saying that change cannot happen in those conditions, but we know that change is either stagnant or very slow in coming. Um, So when we kind of step outside those uh, municipal boundaries and start thinking regionally, I think that that is uh, just going to lead to such a winning combination of impact and projects and growth. And what can we do to um, to really create the kind of inclusive, vibrant, robust communities um, that people want to live in and uh, the people want to be proud to live there as well. Now, you've had to make some tough choices, I assume, over the last 10 years in office, whether it be budget, whether it be land use bylaws, whether it be this, that or the other. And this can weigh on local representatives, especially the government of proximity because you're not going off to Halifax to do your job. You're not no. going off to Ottawa. You're in your community 24-7. Does it weigh on you that the decisions you make are going to impact your residents, your neighbors, your friends, your family members every time that you cast a vote at that council table? Uh, yes, it can be. We Sometimes we deal with um, some challenging decisions at our council table. And the way that I approach those decisions is, um, you know, you just have to be um, as open uh, and transparent and as accountable as you can with all the information that pertains to a given issue. And nine times out of 10, if there is a lot of contention around a decision, um, most of the cases are people just don't have either the right information or enough information. So sometimes when we do have those decisions, I like to just encourage our council, just let's slow it down. Um, Let's take the time we need to hear from citizens so that you know, we all get to a place of so that what, you know, the people want and the decision the council makes is fully informed and fully considered. Um, so we have had a few um, interesting uh, projects that, you know, certainly, you know, when you think about it, you, you know, 10 years down the road, this is where we need to go. Although sometimes, you know, change is a top sell. Um, and And even though it's a tough sell, again, if you give all of the information, if you're very open and transparent, and and sometimes you have to be a little steadfast. Um, And then people will, um, as they understand and get the correct information, because sometimes misinformation leads people down a path of stagnation and, 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 and status quo. And I like that's my biggest fear in this role is is that status quo is just you know 
just trudging along without, you know, taking any kind of risk without, you know, you know, <laughs> like sometimes it depends what kind of leadership you want to pursue. If you want to um, ensure that you are going to get reelected in four years, then you're going to make decisions within those windows. And if you want to do what's right, sometimes they're not the popular choices. Sometimes you might not get reelected, but you know what's for the best of your municipality. That's where I am. So I will go to bed at night with a clean conscience and, and knowing I'm making the best possible decisions for the community, even if it might not get me reelected. I just, I, you know, I have to lead with my heart it, as well as my mind and my experience. Um, and when there is contentious decisions, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah, we just try to to do the absolute best for, for the community and for citizens so that they have the best possible information. And, you know, sometimes when it gets emotional, information doesn't matter and that's, and that's okay. Um, but I will say in my, in the 11 years I have served, that um, you know, it's it's we've had a lot of community support. Um, our community members are amazing. They see and embrace a lot of the changes. Like Port Hawkesbury is on on the move, and and uh, you know we're really love seeing that growth and community pride happening. I hate p uh, painting broad strokes uh, with uh, the residents of Canada, but I think I need to when I talk about municipal issues because. I believe, and this is just my opinion here, that the average resident doesn't, there's there's apathy when it comes to municipal governance. There's apathy when it comes to the issues that municipalities are dealing with, because it's not partisan like you see federally or provincially where you can right. get one side or the other. It's just for the community. Do you see yourself and do you see the uh, the town as having an apathy problem with people actually being engaged in the decision. So you talk about telling your councils to go out and talk to people. Are people willing to give their opinions on the issues that matter to them? Or are, is there an apathy in the community, do you believe? Okay, so I guess um, I believe that your a council's ability uh, to engage their, their community I think as part and parcel for, for the job. I think it's it's really important um, to make sure that you, like I had mentioned earlier in our in our interview, you know, not just for little girls and boys, but you want to create an invitation, um, you know, to learn more about the municipality and the work that we do. And I know going into it, I really had no concept. So I feel like the more open your door is then the more citizens are interested in in local government and then they're learning exactly you know where those powers lie because i i can tell you that you know even though you can be as inclusive as possible you can put out all the best information you can create the best invitation for folks to come and check out your council meetings um but they're the i say on average um, because you're the proximity uh, to the people in terms of government, they often don't um, decipher what a municipal responsibility is from a provincial responsibility. And then again, from a federal uh, responsibility, they just see you, you are the person they know, you are the person that they've stopped next to the bread rack and Sobeys and you are gonna help them solve their problem. Um, so that's, and that's okay. Again, that's an invitation um, to say, you know what? Like if, if it's a problem that is municipal, like let's sit down and, and chat about it. Let's look at solutions. Um, and sometimes you can kind of cultivate, uh, uh, I guess, um, you know, some interest in, in municipal government that way. Sometimes people aren't interested. They just want you to fix things. And then, you know, and sometimes you're really kind of acting as a navigator and you're connecting citizens with, their MLAs or their MPs, depending on, on what the issue is. Um, I feel like definitely, I think we has, have a ways to go to change that, I guess, um, I guess that theme, I guess that, that reality. Um, can I jump in yeah, here for a second? Because I want to ask a question. And I apologize sure. if it comes out of left field here, but you, you talk about the jurisdictional rules, the roles that uh, all levels of yeah. government play. You've been in office for over a, just, a, just a decade now. Um, have you seen that change recently? Have you yeah. seen more residents, yes. <laughs> particularly after the pandemic, where municipal politicians like yourself and your council members are being 
asked and tasked with the residential concerns provincially and federally? The short answer definitely is yes. So okay. um, I know municipalities are oftentimes because we are the government of proximity, as I mentioned, you know, and we are expected to resolve the the whether they be um, challenges with uh, health care retention and recruitment, um, whether it's, uh, you know, just. I'm thinking I'm thinking healthcare is is just like the is just the best example, but the second probably biggest example is housing. And you know, we get the calls. You know, I've been looking for eight weeks um, for for a house in in Port Hawkesbury, and you know, I'm I'm enrolled in NSCC in the Nautical Institute this fall, and I'm gonna have to, you know, I'm gonna miss out on a whole year of education if I can't find an apartment or a place to stay. So like we get those calls. Um, so more and more um the citizens bar none are expecting us to find solutions for them um but also more and more i and i guess this is this is twofold um there is an expectation more and more for by the federal government and the provincial government that municipalities are going to take more of an active role in housing for example just throwing that one out there <laughs> it's not like i'm going to ask about housing in about five minutes here brenda yeah, no, but okay I, I, I feel like i have like your sheet and i kind of peeked at it and but well I, yeah. i'm just putting this out here you've mentioned the government of proximity twice i feel like every time that those words are uttered on this show i need to give uh scott pierce at least like a dollar worth of royalties because he said it <laughs> as fcm president and Absolutely. i say it all the time too um yeah uh, so before we do turn to issues, I want to ask one last question on the issue, the role of council. Um, you, you talk about getting stopped in your local grocery store, yes. and it happens because you are the, the local – exactly. Have you found that balance of personal life and uh, being a councillor? Because I, I'm going to go out on a limb here. The mayor of Port Hawkesbury is not a full-time job but it is a full-time job. You are not you're, paid full-time. You're exactly right. <laughs> you are not paid full-time, but you are on full-time. You're, you're exactly right. And um, I feel like that reality is most definitely a personal choice. So um, many towns across Nova Scotia, I really can't speak for all towns all from shore to shore to shore across the, the, the country, um, but typically we are paid part-time elected officials and leaders. Um, however, I know with the close uh, relationships that I share with other mayors and wardens, um, you know, all across uh, Nova Scotia, you know, it's a labor of love. Like we do this job, not for the money. <laughs> we do this job because we love it because we like to kind of think we're kind of good at it from time to time. And you know, we certainly aren't compensated for our time. I, I can, like, I without uh, hesitation say I, I dedicate full time uh, to the job that I do at the town hall in Port Hawkesbury. I'm only compensated, um, you know, marginally for that. Um, and, and that therein lies a, a little bit of a problem uh, with recruiting new elected officials to council table. Um, you know, there's there's a couple of things, I think, that that impact that. You know, first and foremost, the the compensation offered to do this work. It's not easy work. You got to be the jack of all trades uh, in this in this level of government and know a little bit about absolutely everything. And then you have to know a little bit about everything that the province does and everything that the federal government does um, just to help kind of uh, network people to where they, they need to be and, and navigate them where they need to be. Um, the other thing is, you know, there's always a dark side. <laughs> Of, of being uh, an elected official um, and, you know, definitely a, a, across genders, but particularly um, can be a challenge for, for women um, and underrepresented women and minorities can be, can be a challenge. Um, social media can be such a wonderful tool. It can also be a nightmare of no return. <laughs> and, and it's hard. So how do we, you know, we want a thriving nation um, from a local government standpoint, um, but how do we um, create a more enabling environment for the right people to step up? So, um, you know, it can be super challenging. And I think there's just a, like, and I'm not saying 
I, I don't get broad support. Like I get like, com I've definitely had my, my issues along the way um, with, um, you know, social media and kind of, you know, not the best be dealing with not the best behaviors. Um, but I also have like wonderful supports to kind of counterbalance that. But I do know that code of conduct is, is a huge issue. Um, and I, I, you know, and I'm sure Scott um, in his uh, tenure um, with FCM um, will quickly learn if he doesn't already um, that code of conduct is, is an important issue um, all across the country. And if we want to keep the really great elected officials in place that we that we have now, you know, we really, you know, want to get support provincially to be able to have, you know, a code of conduct um, that, you know, isn't going to make municipal government so scary uh, and a venture to, to try. I, I appreciate your candor on that. I, I want to turn to the issues now, if that's okay. And before I, I, I say this, I want to preface this question by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not sure. a policy of council. This is not <laughs> anything to do with council. This is the mayor's sure. opinion. For some reason, okay. I get a lot of emails about this. Okay. In your <laughs> in your opinion, okay. what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Port Hawkesbury? as of recording this interview? Okay, so the biggest issue at this time is housing for the town of Port Hawkesbury. Uh, so we have actually identified five priority areas for the town of Port Hawkesbury. The council has really been digging into and looking for solutions and looking for collaborative partnerships to try to move the needle on all five. Housing surely is, is one of those top items. Um, that we've been focusing on uh, a couple of years back. We worked with the Cape Breton Partnership on a housing survey because we really wanted to take the pulse of what was what was really happening in Port Hawkesbury. Because up to that point, we knew it was a challenge, um, but all of the information we were getting from citizens and potential citizens that just couldn't find housing in town was anecdotally. And we didn't we didn't have those kind of hard and fast facts. So we did a housing survey with the Cape Breton Partnership and we had something I'm sure was like in excess of, of 680 responses. So for a very small town like Port Hawkesbury, that's just statistically quite significant. Um, and, and basically the, the survey was, you know, are you looking for a for housing in Port Hawkesbury? So it wasn't like the region, it was just for the town of Port Hawkesbury. So, the need for housing for Port Hawkesbury is all across the spectrum from seniors housing, student housing, housing for families, affordable housing. And it, it shames me to say that we have a very like little to no ex, uh, um, accessible housing for, for people of all ages and all abilities. You know, the, this is something that really does keep me up at night. Um, and but we do have uh, amazing uh, in, initiatives that we we are working with partners. Um, for example, uh, we have um, uh, an organization or a society called uh, Lee Side, and they have the only um, women's shelter uh, to service the entire Strait area. And our straight area is in excess of 50,000 people, and we have five beds for, for, for emergency care. Um, so one of the projects that we would love to see across the finish line is to have um, some second stage housing so that we can free up some of that emergency housing and have, you know, an options for women and their families, you know, just as they're transitioning to wherever their forever home is. So this is a project that we're working with multiple partners to make happen. Um, we are working with the Strait Area Chamber of Commerce um, in terms of how do we move the needle on housing. So we were able to work um, through the Chamber of Commerce as partners with New Dawn Enterprises, which is a social enterprise and housing is one of their huge mandates. Um, and they kind of gave us a little bit of a working document, like what can Port Hawkesbury do as a local government um, to create an enabling environment for housing. So we have short, medium and long-term objectives in that document that we are gonna continue to work, work on. Um, so housing is definitely a, a, a big one. Um, and I, I did use an example earlier on about getting calls from students 
trying to, you know, take their, their post-secondary at uh, the Nova Scotia Community College and the Nautical Institute. I mean, so just student housing in and of itself, you know, we have an influx every fall of students of all ages that are attending that campus and it can be anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 um, enrollments. And isn't that wonderful? That's, a, that's amazing news. Um, and isn't it wonderful that we have so many people looking for housing in town? Like that's something that, that we really need to celebrate. Um, however, like let's make sure that everybody has a, a suitable, affordable um, place to live. And I do want to mention also with regard to housing, like we we have um, an amazing um, population of professional retired seniors. And right now they don't have a turnkey option so that they can, you know, kind of downsize from their home into like something that's turnkey, you know, um, that that really is a, a great quality um, option for them. Um, so we really need to move the needle on that too, because we are, you know, we're, go we're, we're going to lose uh, those uh, retired professionals to other communities who do have that turnkey option. So these that's like a long homework list <laughs> for housing, but we are. It, it, um, it's a long homework <laughs> list, but I want to just jump in because you know, I know that this is that housing is not just a municipal issue. You need all partners to come to the table. You need Absolutely. the federal government, you need the provincial government, you need the municipality, and you even need nonprofit organizations to come to the table Absolutely. when you talk about affordable housing and uh, seniors' housings. Um, as mayor, is this happening? As mayor, are you trying to get these conversations happening in the realm of local, and I, I say smaller town communities like Port Hawkesbury, because yes. uh, mo most of the time we all often think of Halifax is going to get all the big issues. Sydney is going to get all the big issues or the big housing projects and sort of the smaller communities are getting left behind. So for you, are you seeing movement where smaller communities are potentially getting those uh, housing developments and whether it be affordable, whether it be uh, senior long-term homes? Right. So I feel like the the pathway to success and in, in what your what your question suggests, um, I feel like there is a capacity challenge um, yeah. that currently faces small communities. And my sense is that you know even in my my role as the president of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, um, is that you know there there's almost these these programs are coming out like rapid housing. And, you know, you've got um, some communities that have the great fortune to have um, like social enterprises as potential managers and development arms to be able to um, help out and has capacity um, applying to these these programs. And then you have some communities they don't have any not for profit um, that they can work directly with. And, and of course, as municipal governments, we, you know, we have to work within the parameters of the Municipal Government Act. Um, so here in, in Nova Scotia, for example, um, some municipalities might have a lot, might not have a lot of, of capital investment to put into housing projects as a contribution, um, but we, some of us have a lot of land that we can contribute to projects. Um, but we we can only do that with not for profits. So so as you can see, there are a lot of important puzzle pieces that need to be in place before a community can even put forward a proposal, um, you know, and 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 have that cost shared with other orders of government, like the obviously the the federal government and the in the province of Nova Scotia. Um, so uh, I think on on the flip side of there, on the yeah. flip side of that, sorry, Brenda, sorry, uh, okay. Mayor. Um, are people wanting to build? Because that's the other aspect that we always yes. forget that we we talk about the needs and the wants, but unless we have people to build these houses, we're, we're going to be stuck in this uh, perpetual cycle of not I having the homes. So are people coming yeah. to the Port Hawkesbury and as uh, as president of uh, Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, are you hearing from your members that people want to build? You just need the resources and the uh, help from the other levels of government to actually build these houses as well. Yeah, so I can't I can't necessarily speak to um, some I guess anecdotal uh, information I'm hearing with, from other municipalities, but I certainly use our uh, municipality as an example. Um, so over the past four or five years, you know, I've certainly been contacted by um, private sector developers 
who have, um, you know, attempted to apply for some of those programs for affordable housing where they um, I did or reserve um, some units for affordability uh, for a 10 year term or whatnot, um, and having a, a lot of trouble being able to access those programs. So um, there definitely is a desire uh, from folks in the private sector to, to do that. Um, I can't necessarily speak to examples per se about uh, not for profit other than Lee Side Society. So we know. Um, they are quite interested in second stage housing and the town is, is, is happy to help, um, you know, but, but certainly in attempting to get that project into the proposal stage and, and apply for programming, you know, there are so many hurdles that municipalities face with, with that regard. Um, and what I, I'd like to see um, on, you know, the, with the other orders of government, you know, make sure that they are, um, creating some equity for these smaller communities so that not all of the funding is going to the urban centers. We, we definitely want to see that, you know, spread a little bit more equitably so that smaller towns and rural municipalities who are facing challenges in, in housing the same as every other community across the nation um, so that they ha can definitely have some um, ability to, to apply for those funds. But, uh, yeah, so two things. We definitely, um, some municipalities need help with, with applications and, and the funding and, and, and maybe even to be connected with a not-for-profit who would be willing to work with them. Um, and in Port Hawkesbury's, uh, as an example, we are actively trying to work with other municipalities to create a not-for-profit that we um, can can look at more affordable housing projects in the future. So, you know, there's there's so many puzzle pieces when it comes to housing, and it's just so complex. It's like an onion with so many layers. And yes, municipalities are are interestingly enough being tapped on the shoulder to to take on way more responsibility for housing than traditionally has been our responsibility. Um, and some municipalities are saying, yes, like, let's, let's figure out ways to do that. Per Hawkesbury um, certainly is interested in, you know, how can we create the most enabling environment we can for housing. Um, other municipalities, like I mentioned, they, they just, uh, they need to build capacity to even be able to, to move the needle even remotely. I, I had two two last questions in the segment. I don't know which one to go with, but I'm going to go with this one because we're, we're talking about your role as president of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities. Now, right. you're coming up to your annual general meeting here, if I'm not mistaken, in November. So I'm going to ask right. you to put your, your NSFM hat on for two seconds while you answer this sure. question. Um, looking back on the last year as president of the organization, have you seen movements in the municipal files that you wish that you wanted to when you first started this position in uh, November of last year? And sort of the follow-up question to that is, what do you see as the state of municipalities in the province of Nova Scotia today? Sure. So that's just such a small question. <laughs> <laughs> Should I just whip up an answer in like two seconds? Give me okay. your elevator pitch, Brenda. Come on. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. So the first question. Um, so when I, I when I stepped up uh, as president, uh, and I I do want to you know certainly uh, mention the hard work of our outgoing president, uh, Mayor Amanda McDougall from the CBRM. Um, you know, so so files that we were working on throughout that transition. Um, was around uh, creating a new set of bylaws for the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities um, so that, you know, we are, you know, kind of creating a very sound foundation from which to do our work. So, I mean, that was a very long haul um, and that, that work certainly uh, needed to continue as I came on as, as president and we were able um, to establish those new bylaws. So this fall at our convention, we're actually going to See the fruit of the labor of, of that. So we'll have a, uh, which what's really cool about the changes that we've implemented is that um, for the first time in our history as an organization, we're going to have, um, you know, such equitable representation 
from shore to shore to shore across our province. Um, so we'll have each, each region will have two representatives um, with the president and vice president uh, elected at large. Um, before when we had our elections, it was whoever showed up. Now um, we have that very equitable geographic representation in place plus e-voting. So, so everyone can vote for who they want to be represented on the board. Um, we stepped away from the resolution process uh, that we normally did and now uh, in favor for areas of municipal interest. So why we made that move was um, when we were locked in, say for example, Chris, with you know five resolutions, um, as you know, uh, municipal government is certainly a moving target. It's like it's an ever-changing landscape. So if something popped up, I don't know, say like Hurricane Fiona or say like the global pandemic that you know then nsfm is is working outside of the mandate that's been given to them by their members so this new kind of bylaw structure allows for us to be much more nimble reactive and proactive in the work that we do so really proud um, that uh, i was able to continue that work uh, started by uh, mayor mcdougall um, and that we're going to have a, a really solid foundation uh, to continue the great work that the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities does on behalf of, of all uh, 49 municipalities. Um, of course, I, we did already talk about some of the other um, pressing uh, challenges uh, that have are impacting the town. Certainly um, no, no different than every other municipality across the province. Um, we're certainly feeling the pressures of housing um, all across uh, the municipalities. We're, we're also um, feeling the, the uh, repercussions of, of climate change. And, you know, certainly how can we as an organization, you know, work with the other orders of government, um, again, to be prepared um, to make sure our communities are able to access um, programming, you know, to for climate adaptation um, to help in real time, you know, when we're having weather incidents and also after the effect. I mean, the extreme weather has been like, I don't even know the right word for it. It's been, it's it's just been extreme, I guess is the, is, is abs absolute, actually the best word. Um, and also, I guess uh, the elephant in the room really is around municipal financing. So we are, I, I, I feel like every single elected official across the nation will agree that municipalities are expected to do more and more and more with less and less and less. And there's absolutely a desire from elected officials to do the most that they can for their municipalities. We wanna be able to um, grow our municipalities in new wonderful ways. We want to be able to accommodate people because let's face it, people are our number one resource across the nation. People are, uh, we, but we, our communities need to be ready for people and we need to be ready from an infrastructure perspective. We need to be ready, um, you know, to, to be as inclusive as possible with programming, et cetera. So there's like municipalities do a lot. However, the way that we are being funded um, is kind of archaic. Like it would, it would be good to have um, modern and modernization of how uh, municipalities are financed. So if we are gonna be taking on more and more responsibilities and you know we just see that big capital H housing kind of coming down the pipe <laughs> so we you know please let that follow with um with funding um and not only for actual housing builds but the infrastructure to support new housing um for capacity around project management um you know it's just it's just such a a, a huge complex um thing and in, you know, and in, in currently in Nova Scotia, one thing that we're we're working on as an organization um, is we're we're working closely with the province of Nova Scotia on service exchange to do to do just that. It's it's not going to be it's going to have to be done in phases because we're working with a service exchange agreement that was drafted in, in 1995. 
So surprisingly, or not so surprisingly, it no longer is a good fit for for our, for our current realities. I know you're shocked. I'm shocked. <laughs> so shocked, you say? Um, I am cautious of time, and I want to turn to the last subject because I, I want to make sure I get this in because it's my favorite part of these interviews. It's about tourism because I love tourism. Sure. I love. I, I think Same. more Canadians should be visiting more of our communities in Canada instead of spending their economic dollars somewhere else. They need to do it here in our own backyard. So for someone who may be coming to Nova Scotia, say, next spring, potentially, right. or even in November to attend a certain conference in Nova Scotia. I'm not saying it's me, but I'm just saying it might happen. Uh, <laughs> what what would one do in Port Hawkesbury as a tourist? And what are the hidden gems in the community? Okay, well, I would be a shameful Cape Redner <laughs> if I didn't mention Celtic Colors. So it's, it's something that occurs every October, um, on the island of Cape Breton, and our actually the the traditional name for Cape Breton is Unamagi, which is Nigma for Land of Fog. We have people who come from all over the the, the world uh, to attend Celtic Colors. It's a festival of music, of culture, of food, food, food. <laughs> And You've sold me. <laughs> of course, Cape Breton is on the national stage. We are the number one island in North America, I think something like seven years in a row. Um, there is that. It's it's unmatched by beauty. Um, our communities are so friendly. And yeah, so we, we invite you to come and, and visit for sure um, in, in Cape Breton Island. Stop in Port Hawkesbury and say hi to me. I'll be probably flipping eggs at the fleur de lis and that's okay. I'll, I will come out to say hi um, and just explore our beautiful island. And, uh, and whether you are arriving by land, air, or sea, um, you're going to just be welcomed in Nova Scotia. Like, you know, of course, Atlanta, in Atlantic Canada, um, it's just a wonderful place to visit. But certainly that invitation to, to visit uh, the island of Cape Breton is, is open for beyond October. <laughs> Anytime you want to come and visit. So I'm going to ask the million dollar question now, and this is the most important question because I think all municipal leaders need to be able to answer this question. What makes the town of Port Hawkesbury such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Okay, so what makes, well, I came back. <laughs> Why would I come back? <laughs> So Port Hawkesbury is such a wonderful oceanside town. It's quaint, it's beautiful. The people are so friendly. Um, and I, I wanna say that why I have decided to lay down anchor in, in Port Hawkesbury after growing up in Port Hawkesbury and like all teenagers do go off, flutter off into the world uh, to see, you know, what what's all what's what is there about uh, elsewhere and you know maybe you know have some life adventures try not to get into too much trouble so i ended up returning to port hawkesbury because it is such a wonderful place to raise my family it's safe i mean there's everything um it's it's like a small town um vibe it's super safe but it has everything like everything that you need that you would find in the urban centers, but, you know, such a, a nice relaxing vibe. So um, yeah, I like there's, I could probably spend another hour talking about why Port Hawkesbury is the, the, the place, but I would get in too much trouble with my neighbors. So I'll stop there. <laughs> um, Brenda, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for sitting down and taking time out of your busy day to do this. I know you've been uh, quite busy over the last month, so thank you for taking time out of your day and sitting down and chatting. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Now, your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of making municipality issues matter again. Now, as we wrap up, I hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate worlds of municipal politics and municipal government from today's interview. 
Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with this show, Cross Border Interviews, but all of our shows, Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown, Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. But you're also playing an intricate role, a vital role, if that, in supporting our endeavors to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission of making municipal issues prominent on a national stage, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca and clicking on that support us now page. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can deliver the kind of content like today's interview you've come to expect from us. Once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, keep talking.